certainly. I know that if you call on him, he will hear you. And he will answer before the day is over. Greetings to everyone. In the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is so good that we, we can be back where we belong this Wednesday evening. My production team is here ready waiting on me. And of course I'm asking you now to call those who have always been studying and worshipping with you. Have your Bible and your notepads and your highlighters and your markers and whatever. And let us look into the word of the Lord together another Wednesday evening. In the name of Jesus Christ, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our God and our Father, in the name of Christ, our Lord and King, your servants approach your throne another evening, giving you thanks for the privilege granted to us to come to your throne, to minister your word to your peoples everywhere as they tune in another evening to listen to the breaking of the bread. Breathe upon us, Father, especially upon your servant who stands in the gap. Let everything about him be approved by you. Give me your grace and your favor and your anointing and your utterance. And Father, bless all those who worship with us. When we should have come to the end of this session, we'll be very careful to attribute the praise and the glory and the thanks to your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Greetings again, everyone. Before the day is over and before the night is through, certainly, God will come through for you. It's a joy to be back where we belong this Wednesday evening. And may his grace and his favor be with us. Well, we have been doing according to his divine will, studying his words together. And when we closed off last Wednesday, we told you that we would begin a new series this Wednesday. And so the new series which we will begin this evening is Jesus Christ, the story of redemption. Jesus Christ, the story of redemption. Bear that is mine in mind. Jesus Christ, the story of redemption. My friends, I believe it's going to be a very interesting series indeed. As we look at Jesus Christ, who is himself the story of redemption. My friends, the story of Jesus Christ goes further than his birth. I repeat that the story of Jesus Christ goes further back than his birth or his crucifixion or even his resurrection. Jesus Christ is a central figure of Christianity. And the entire story of his life and ministry is the basis for the New Testament scriptures, whether one believes it or not. We see Christ as both our Messiah and Redeemer, and the Bible, which is the word of God, tells us all that we need to know about him. So when we look at him for this series, Jesus Christ, the story of redemption, we will be revealing quite a bit of his story. We see him again as both our Messiah and our Redeemer. And I repeat that the Bible, which is the word of God, tells us all that we need to know about him. And my friends, the basis of the Bible, the basis of the Bible, there are very few historical sources exit. There are very few historical sources exist that really concerning the real fact of his entire life and the ministry when he, the Savior, lived among human. I said that the basis of the study of this scripture is to re reveal him to you who he was. And beside the Bible, 
there are very few historical sources exist that really concerning the real fact of his entire life and ministry when he the Savior walked and lived among men. And so it is a real challenge for us to find information about him outside of the religious text of the sacred word. However, there are some real fascinating revelations about him that have been revealed to us in recent decades that are very revealing, exciting, and informing. And of course, there are few persons living, there are very few persons living who will attempt to dispute the fact that there was a very strange man named Jesus Christ who lived among human over 200 years, over 2,000 years ago. And that he was a great teacher of godliness. He was a great teacher of godliness and righteousness who impacted the entire universe by his miracles and his controversial religious claims that he was a son of God, the long expected and prophesied of Messiah. And my friends, his divine declaration caused the religious authorities in Jerusalem to reject him. I said, his divine declaration caused the religious authorities in Jerusalem to reject him and sought to kill him. They hated him, they persecuted him, and what? Eventually, they were successful in having him killed, put to death by crucifying him on the cross of Calvary. And not only the rel religious leaders, but the Roman civil authorities also saw Jesus as a threat to their power and authority. And so they became very complicit in our Lord's execution. And the religious leaders of his time, both Judaism and paganism, strongly opposed his teachings and subsequent growth of his religion. And as a result, they used unlawful, malicious, and violent means to destroy his teaching and damage the church that he had founded. Not only that, my friends, but the government of Rome also came against him. The government of Rome also came against Christ in vigorously persecuting his followers and tracing the teacher from Galilee out of town. And even in our 21st century, there are still much confusion and strange religious questions concerning this very controversial figure Jesus Christ. And the only source that the church can go to for answers is the Bible, which contains infallible word, the infallible word of God concerning this very strange man, Jesus Christ. In the Bible, we can discover who was this mystery man from Nazareth. Who was this mystery man from Nazareth? Where did he originally come from? How did he reach here among human? What was his main purpose of coming here? What was the main essence of his teachings? Was he God in the flesh? Or one of the prophets? Who or what did he resemble? 
Was he only human? And why did he have to die? Well, all of these questions I will be answering throughout this series. And I repeat, in the Bible I said, we can discover who was this mystery man from Nazareth. Where did he originally come from? How did he reach here? What was his main purpose of coming? What was the main essence of his teaching? Was he God in the flesh? Or was he one of the prophets? Who or what did he resemble? Was he only human? And why did he have to come here? Why did he have to die? I repeat, we shall endeavor to answer these very stubborn questions throughout this very exciting series. And in this, our short study, however, let us discover the very true and fascinating history of this mystery man that so few persons really grasp or understand. Yes, the very awesome story of the only God-man who ever lived among humans. And the very fearfully misunderstood message of redemption that he preached to Adam's fallen race. Uh -huh. And it is still a wonder. And his message will continue to be a wonder throughout human history. The message he preached was the everlasting gospel of salvation. The good news of the coming kingdom of God, the eternal father. My friends, some of the most scary and provoking declarations class, did you hear me? Some of the most scary and provoking declarations that he ever made are found in the gospel of St. John, particularly St. John chapter 8, verses 1 to 59. I repeat that some of the most scary and provoking declarations that our Lord ever made are found in the Gospel of St. John, particularly chapter 8, verses 1 to 59, that we'll be dissecting this moment. In his discussion with the Jews, he said, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me, and you have rejected me, and you, you hate me. This particular story came about when the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And they wanted him, Christ, to abide by Moses' law in condemning this adulterous woman to death. By stoning her. And by the way, where was the man with whom this woman was really committing adultery with? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Why have they brought the woman alone? Was this a setup? We will discover it in our series. Verse 6 of the text tells us that. Their motive for bringing the woman to Christ was just to tempt him. Well, having well aware that he was a man of mercy and compassion. And he would have mercy on the woman. Ah, he would have mercy and compassion on her. And he would have mercy on all those who come to him for mercy. But then, 
they would accuse him of disobeying the law if he had mercy on her and did not encourage Moses' law by stoning her to death, then they would immediately lay a charge against him that he, our Lord himself, was breaking the law. But after they laid their case before the Lord, and having the poor woman standing before them, and you may well imagine that they had their heap of stones ready to stone her. And where, I don't know where they have gotten so much stone from, but every case they've always had a heap of stone. But while they were waiting on the Lord's verdict, the Bible said, our Lord stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, kept on writing as if he did not hear them. And verse 7 of the text tells us that they, they continued posing their question to the Lord. Posing their question to Jesus. While he stooped down and with his finger writing on the ground. But he lifted up his head. And said unto them. He that is without sin among you. Go ahead. Pick up the first stone. And start stoning this guilty woman. And then he stooped down again and he continued to write on the ground with his finger. Verse 9 tells us that they who heard the Lord's message became convicted. What was his message? Anyone without sin. Grab the first stone and begin stoning this adulterous woman. That's what verse, look at verse 9 again, tells us that they who heard the Lord's message became convicted by their own conscience. And they all departed one by one, beginning from the eldest even unto the youngest one. Until Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in his midst. Look at verse 10 class. When Jesus, when Jesus had lifted up his head and looked around, he did not see anyone but the poor woman standing. And he said unto her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Where are those who condemn you? I am now ready to declare my verdict. I am now ready to deal with the case. Where are they? Verse 11 tells us that the woman said to Jesus, No man condemn me, my Lord. And Jesus said unto the woman, I do not condemn you either. I do not condemn you either. You may go, but don't do it again. You may go, but don't do it again. Look at verse 12. Then Jesus continued speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees. Then he told them that he is the light of the world. Now this is where the story coming to bump. We're getting into the meat and the substance and the synergy of the lesson. Verse 12. Then Jesus, he continued speaking to the scribes. And the Pharisees. Then he told them that he is the light of the world. And anyone who follows him shall not walk in darkness. But shall have the light of life. And the verse 13. Then the Pharisees attacked him by criticizing him. That he is commending himself. And his commendation is a lie. Can you imagine that? Verse 14. Our Lord responded to them by telling them that. Even though he.
be a record of himself, yet his record is true. For I know where I am coming from. And I know where I'll be going when I leave here. But none of you can tell me where you, are, where you come from. And where you're going when you leave here. Hmm. This makes the thing a little more complicated, isn't it? Verse 15. You speak after your flesh and judge one another. But I judge no man, Jesus said. And if I judge anyone, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but my Father who sent me is with me. Look on the verse 29. He that sent me is with me. For my Father never left me alone. For I only do those things that pleases him. Those things that please him. Verse 30. And as he spoke, many believed on him. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the verse 33, Then they answered him, saying, Listen good, we are Abram's children, we are Abram's descendants, and we were never in bondage. We were never in bondage. So we do not understand what you are saying to us that if we believe your word, we will be free. We are always free. We don't need your message to make us free. How are you telling us that we shall be free if we know you, your word and abide by them? We are Abram's children. We are free. We've never been bound. So away with that man. Verse 34. Now class story is really coming to bump, you know. Jesus answered them and saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is a servant of sin. 35. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son lives there. Hallelujah. Verse 36. And if the son shall make you free, then you are free indeed. 37. I know that you are Abram's seed. And yet you are seeking to kill me. Because my word has no place in you. Yet you declare that you belong to Abraham. You are Abram's seed. 39. If you were Abram's children then you would do the work of Abraham. 40. But now you seek to kill me because I'm a man who told you the truth. Huh, this is very serious. This is getting very serious in our class. Because I tell you the truth, you seek to kill me. I have heard of... I have heard... Of God. Did not Abram tell you the truth? Do you do the deeds of your father? Listen now class. I'm going to repeat this because. This is where I begin to really. Get into the synergy and the substance. Of the evening story. We are studying. Our Lord's declaration, St. John 8. Then the Pharisees attacked him by criticizing, verse 13, by criticizing him that he is he's commending himself and his commendation is a lie. Our Lord responded to them by telling them that 
even though he bears record of himself, yet his record is the truth. For I know where I am coming from, and I know where I'm going when I leave here. But you neither know where you come from or where you're going. <laughs> Jesus is a rough preacher in our class. Look at it. <laughs> Look at verse 15. You speak after your flesh and judge one another. But I judge no one. I judge no one. Verse 16. And if I judge anyone, my judgment is the truth. For I am not alone. But my father who sent me is with me. I repeat verse 29. And said he that sent me. The man who sent me is with me. He that sent me is with me. For my father never left me alone. For I am only doing those things that please him. And so all these messages aggravated them. We go down to the verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's seed. When they condemn the Lord in telling him, you don't have to free us. You can't free us. We are free people. We are from Abraham's seed. We are free. We don't need you to tell us anything that we can obey you and you make us free. We are free. We are Abraham's seed. So away with that, man. I know that, G verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's seed, Jesus said, and yet you are seeking to kill me. How can you be Abraham's seed and seeking to kill me? Because my word has no place in your heart. So you're seeking to kill me. Yet you are declaring that you're Abraham's seed. If you were Abraham's children, then you would do the work of Abraham. Ah, verse 40 that I choose to repeat. But now you seek to kill me because I am a man who told you the truth. Because I'm a man who told you the truth. You seek to kill me. Huh? Well, look at 41. Do you do the deeds of your father? Listen to me. Now class, this is where I reversed. Pick it up now. Then said they unto Jesus, We are not born of fornication. Huh? We have one father who is God. Now, class, I know you have read this, and this may be one of your memory gem, but we are going to delve into the mystery of this. Then said they unto Jesus, look what they said. We are not born of fornication. We have one Father who is God. Good God. Mm, this thing is tough here. Think about it. According to the verse 39, they were contrary to the Jews' claim that they were Abraham's children. Our Lord insisted that they were not the true children of Abraham. Because their hatred of Jesus, they refused to listen to the truth. The lack of simple faith in God belied belied them or cause them to lie or make them a liar. Think about it. Jesus said contrary to the Jews claim that they were Abraham's children. Our Lord insisted that they were not the true children of Abraham. Their hatred of Jesus their refusal to listen to the truth and lack of simple faith in God Allow them to be liars. Their profession that they are Abram's children. They are lying. Now class, according to the verse 40 and 41, this is where you are going to shrivel. The Jews insisted that they were children of Abraham. Implied that they regarded their relationship to God as very secure. Their relationship to God is very secure. Very secure one because 
of their the lineal descent from the man with whom God had confirmed his covenant because of the relationship with the man with whom God has conferred his covenant then they are really secured in God but while the covenant had not been abrogated by God our Lord made it quite clear that the Jews needed to exercise individual faith in order to participate in such relationship with God. This is not a generational thing or a congregational thing. It's an individual thing. So while the covenant that God made with Abram had not been abrogated by God, our Lord made it quite abundantly clear that the Jews needed to exercise individual faith in order to participate in such relationship. And Jesus' word gave substance to the teaching and the new birth. And Jesus' word also are parallel with the apostles' teaching in Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians 3, verses 16 to 29. That the heirs of Abram are the relative of Abram, or the descendants of Abram, are not merely those who are descendant from him by blood. But heirs of Abram are those who exercise their faith in God. That's how you become a relative, our sons of Father Abram. The heirs of Abram is a spiritual affairs, and not a blood affairs. While the Jews insisted that they were true descendants of Abraham, our Lord made, made it, or made his flat denial of their claim for being descendant of Abraham as a spiritual claim. For they were not spiritual. And they thought they were descendant of Abraham by blood. And so the Jews protested in verse 41 of St. John chapter 8 that we were not the descendant of fornication. Good God, what were they saying to Jesus? Were they not telling him that he is the descendant of fornication? No, can you imagine things thing like that? You had never seen this class. Look at it for yourself. The Jews protested in verse 41 of St. John chapter 8, our text. That they were not the descendants of fornication. Why are they telling Jesus that? And class, listen to me. While John did not speak directly of the virgin birth. But some of the Jews were aware that there was a mystery surrounding Jesus. There was a mystery surrounding Jesus' origin. And so in any case, in any case, they carnally objecting the virgin's birth. They were carnally objecting the virgin's birth to be a farce. They accepted the virgin's birth to be ridiculous and an empty display there is no such thing as virgin birth. The Jews were unwilling to listen to Jesus' claim. Yet, at the same time, they were resisting that they came from Abraham. Oh, can you imagine that? My friends, in the verse 42 of our text, which is St. John 8, in the verse 42, Jesus gave another evidence of the Jews' hypocrisy. That if they truly love God, as they are professing to be, then such love would, would exhibit itself in the loving of the Son of God. As love for God is a spiritual family affair. Loving God is not a carnal affair. 
is a spiritual thing. Loving God involves loving all whom call it the name of God. The Jews blowing it out of, out of proportion. The Jews blowing it out to Jesus from nowhere that they are not the product of fornication. What audacity. We are not the product. What they were saying, they were what they were saying directly, you are the product of fornication. We are not. We are Abraham's children. Class, had you ever seen this? Had you ever read this? Could you believe that the Jews would have said that? Loving God involves loving all whom call it the name of God, Jesus said. Then the Jews blowing it out of, blowing it out to Jesus. I mean, blasting it out to him from nowhere that they are not the product of fornication. Was very blatantly displaying their ignorance and their arrogance of the knowledge of the virgin birth as a farce. Are a ridiculous and an empty display. In other words, there's no such thing as a virgin birth. Where, where are you from? Who are you coming to tell us that we are not Abraham's children? Eh? They said, but we are the descendant of Abraham. Who are you? <laughs> they are the seed of Abraham. And so they are children of God through Abraham. But Jesus had it laid out to them. But in verse 42, Jesus gave another evidence of the Jews' hypocrisy. If they are from God and they truly love God, they would evidence that relationship by showing love to the Son of God. Ah. But the fact is that they did not believe nor accept Jesus as the Son of God. For there could be no such thing as the virgin birth. Jesus, Jesus' aim was to honor his father. But the Jews' aim was to bring Jesus into disgrace. That was their aim. Jesus wanted to honor his father. The Jews wanted to bring him down to disgrace. We are not the product of fornication. Then who, who is? But Jesus disclaimed all their carnal and selfish idea and relegate the final evaluation of his work to the judgment of God his father. Think about it. To the judgment of God his father. Look at verse Look at verse 42. Jesus said, if God, were you, if God were your father, you would love me. <laughs> For I proceed or I came forth from God. And I did not come here of myself, but my father sent me. Can you understand? Look at the verse 43. Why can you not understand my speech? Simply because you just cannot hear my word. You are deaf. And Jesus is laying it out to them. Look at verse 44. You are of your father the devil. And the will of your father you will always do. Now Jesus is really preaching here now. Your father was a murderer from the beginning. <laughs> you talk about preaching. <laughs> you got to check Reverend Jesus. <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> ah, hallelujah. Look at it again, John 8, 43. Why can you not understand my speech? Simply because you just cannot hear my word. You, you cannot hear. You're deaf. You're hard of hearing. Look at verse 44. You are of your father the devil. And the will of your father you will do. Here, here Jesus preaching. 
your father was a murderer from the beginning. And he abide not in the truth. Because there was no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Verse 45. And because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. 46. Which of you can... Con now look at this class. What a powerful... What a powerful speech here in verse 46 of our text. Which of you can convict me of sin? Ah, which of you? Stand up and tell me. Which of you can convict me that I'm a sinner? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Look at verse 47. He who is of God heareth God's words, right? But you do not hear God's word because you are not of God. Oh, this man is preaching, you know. Look at verse 48. Then the Jews answered and said unto him, Did we tell you before that you are a Samaritan and you are a devil? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. No, can you believe it? Then the Jews answered and said unto Jesus, Didn't we tell you before that you are a Samaritan? And you're a devil. Verse 49. Jesus answered. I am not a devil. But I honor my father. And you dishonor me. Verse 50. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeketh. And judgeth. 51. Verily, verily I say unto you. If a man keep. I love it. If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Now, this, these preaching get these people really arrogant to you know. If a man keep my saying, he shall never die. Look at verse 53. Then the Jews answered him saying, uh, this is where the story come to bomb class. Verse 53. Then the Jews answered Jesus saying, are you greater than our father Abraham? They've gone back to Abram, their father. Inasmuch as Jesus tried to tell them that they are far from being Abram's children. 53. The Jews answered him saying, Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? Huh. And the prophets are dead? Who make you? Where are you from? Verse 54. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. But it is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. 55. Yet you have not known him. He's your God, but you have not known him. But I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. <laughs> but I know him and I keep his word. My goodness, this man is preaching. 56. Your father Abram rejoiced to see my day. Now this is what turned the thing upside down. Your father Abram rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Verse 57. Then said the Jews unto him, you are not even 50 years old. And you have seen Abraham. Where were you? Now class, this is story coming to bump. Ah. The Jews answer him. You are not even 50 years old. And you have seen Abraham. Now class, here is the, here is the bombshell. In verse 58 of the text. And this settles the matter once and for all. Argument finished. Argument done. Our Lord said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> now, now, this really get these people upside. I really turn them upside down, you know. Before Abraham was, was I am. Because I never was. <laughs> My goodness. Armed. Yes. Argument is finished. 
Verse 59. Then they took up stones. I told you. They had stones when they brought the woman taken in adultery. When Jesus tried the case and you remember in the, my introduction and begin to write on the ground, everybody departed one by one. There are some scholars who said as Jesus wrote on the ground, they came and bent over Jesus and they saw Jesus wrote their name and what they did. For he said to them, anyone without sin, pick up the first stone and begin stoning the woman. And he bent down and began to write. And as he wrote on the ground, maybe um, one saw his name and saw what he did and he took off. The other one bent and saw Jesus write his name on the ground and what he did, he took off. And when Jesus was finished writing their deeds, they, Jesus looked up, they were all gone, gone. The case was over. They were all gone. Your father Abram rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and he was glad. But look at verse 57. Then said the Jews unto him, you are not even 50 years old. And you have seen Abraham. Who are you really now? Class. Here's it. Here's the bombshell in verse 58. Of the text. Abram. Jesus spoke. And this settles the matter. Finished it. Argument was finished. He said. You're talking about Abraham. That I don't know Abraham. He said before Abraham was I am. And they got, he really got them upset. Argument is finished. 59. They took up stones to, to kill him. To stone him to death. But Jesus hid himself. And went out of the, out of the temple. Went through the midst of them. And they never saw him. Passed by. And they did not see him. Now they begin to wonder, now who is this man? Class. All that was going on from the verse 1 to 59 of St. John chapter 1 is that our Lord was revealing his true identity to them as the one sent by God the Holy Father to be their Redeemer. But they being blind like blind Barty just could not see the truth and they were deaf they just could not hear the eternal truth of God's word even though even though class even though the New Testament writers have cited the Messianic prophecies from the Old Testament more than 130 times did you hear what I said? Even though the New Testament writers have cited the Messianic prophecies of Christ from the Old Testament more than 130 times. In fact, class, in fact, there are those Bible historians who declare that there are some 300 prophetic passages that point to whom the Messiah is where he would come from and his message his purpose of coming to the earth more than 300 prophetic messages yet they have not read it nor believe in it and what he will do when he comes and who shall give birth to him all this were prophesied of and Class, listen to me. Of these many prophets, 60 of them were major prophets. 60 of them were major prophets who prophesied profoundly concerning the Savior. And according, according to one of the Messianic prophet Isaiah in his prophetic declaration in chapter 9, all these prophecies are being fulfilled in one person. Jesus, the son of the eternal father. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus, the son of the eternal father. And yet, the Jews denied his existence and telling Jesus that they had not come through fornication. 
Think about it. Class, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the infinite one, according to our studies, it is very lacking compared to who he really is. And I didn't say was. Compared to re really who he is. He being the faithful and true witness of his heavenly father. He being the express image of his father's person. He is the supreme devotion to his father's will. As he came to, his, to this world to work out his father's divine plan of revelation for humanity. He came to the earth to work out his father's plan of divine deliverance for humanity. He came to abolish error and establish truth. He came to clean up moral pollution and establish purity. He came to abolish selfishness and establish benevolence. He came to dethrone Satan and enthrone his father God. He came to destroy sin by the sacrifice of himself. Yes, he made himself of no repetition and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of human. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. My friends, look at it. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him. God has also highly exalted him. And give him a name which is above every name. We're talking about Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, that's what we're talking about. Look at it. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him, give, gave him a name a, which is above every name. Look at verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in the heaven, things in the earth, things under the earth. Well, hmm, can you imagine? Selfishness and self-seeking had no place in Jesus Christ. Love, respect, adoration to his infinite father seemed to have swallowed up his egoism. He was entirely self-oblivious as he was lacking all personal attention and he centered all attention to his father. How very often we have heard him said, I seek not my own will, but the will of my father who sent me. O class, had Jesus sought his own glory, he would have been the undefeated leader of all armies. I said, if he had sought his own glory, he would have been the undefeated leader of all armies. He would have been the leader of all nations. Instead of which. He was born. In an animal stable. Lived without a house. Of his own. Died upon a blood stained cross. All this was. anti anti-human. This had to be God. Huh? Selfishness and foolish pride was not in his path. No. no. Selfishness and foolish pride could not be found in him. My friends, a general teaching on the person and life and purpose of Jesus Christ 
can only briefly touch on particular incidents and issues of his life and ministry. The only direct mention by a Roman historian is simply recorded of our Lord's execution by the order of Pontius Pilate. That's all they had to say about him. However, outside the New Testament, there are numerous accounts of the life and teaching of Jesus in the early Christian writings. Even though some of these writings are clearly legendary, only aiming to fill the gap in the narratives, amen, of the gospel. Despite Jesus, Jesus' middle class economic background, you don't mind me saying that, despite Jesus' middle class economic background, yet his chosen style of life from this point onward was one of no, absolutely no financial security. I never thought of that. I repeat this for you. I said despite Jesus' middle class economic background, and you'll agree with me, yet his chosen style of life from this point onward was one of no, absolutely no financial security. He and his disciples lived solely on the contribution of those who support their ministry. Think about it. That's what they lived by. Hospitality of those who supported his ministry. According to St. Matthew chapter 10, these 12 disciples Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go to the last sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go preach the gospel saying the kingdom of God uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick. Cleanse the diseased. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you have received freely give. Don't charge for your labor. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. Neither script for your journey. Neither extra clothing for the workman is worthy of his food. And in whatever city you go or town you shall enter as you inquire who is worthy for you, uh, where is worthy for you to live. Live there until you are ready to depart. Our Lord taught his disciples to rely upon God for all their material needs, according to St. Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 to 34. He, the Savior, was unmarried. And with no settled home. According to Luke's gospel chapter 9. He was free to go from place to place. Heralding the gospel of redeeming grace. Healing the sick. Casting out devils. Nothing to hinder him. And in the early part of his ministry. He was always invited to speak in synagogues. As a visiting teacher and preacher. According to St. Matthew, according to St. Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 39. But his, his very radical teaching was soon be rejected. And so he was found teaching to the vast crowds in the open air for those in charge of the temple rejected him because of his radical teaching. So he had no more pulpit in the temple. So he gathered on the outside in the open air and by the thousands the people flocked in. Yeah. 
and devoting an increasing amount of his time apart from those groups by the thousands that flocked him until he had to work miracles twice to feed them. And other times he spent his precious time tutoring his disciples, his apostles, what they are to do as they carry on the work that he's training them to do. Class, while the Jews blowing it out of, blowing it out to Jesus from nowhere that they are not the product of fornication. That was very blatantly, blatantly displaying their arrogance of the knowledge of the virgin birth. They did not accept the virgin birth. Huh? So they, they very fiercely told the master, we are not the product of fornication. We are Abraham's children. We have one father and God is our father. Yet they hated Jesus and sought to kill him. Huh? As a farce. Are a ridiculous and an empty display in order. In, or in other words, there was no such thing as a virgin birth. We don't accept it. But they are descendants of Abraham. They are the seed of Abraham. And so they are children of God through Abraham. Think about that class. But as I told you, that in verse 42, Jesus gave another evidence of their hypocrisy. If they are from God and they truly loved God, they would evidence that relationship by showing love to their fellow men. They would evidence that relationship by showing their love to Jesus Christ. Yeah. But the fact is that they did not believe nor accept Jesus as a son of God. For there could be no such thing as virgin birth. Uh, Jesus' Jesus' aim was to honor his father. But the Jews', the Jews aim was to bring Jesus down to disgrace and dishonor. Yeah, did you hear me? But Jesus disclaimed all their carnal and selfish idea and relegate the final evaluation of his work and ministry to the judgment of Almighty God. Hallelujah to the judgment of Almighty God. Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me. Uh -huh. For I proceeded or I came forth from God and I did not come of myself but my father sent me. Why can you not understand my speech? What a powerful question in verse 43. Simply because you just cannot hear my word. You are hard of hearing. Look at verse 44 as we wrap up. You are of your father the devil. Oh my goodness. And of your father. You have your father the devil. Was Jesus really meant to say that? You are of your father the devil. And the will of your father you will always do. Your father was a murderer. Because huh? from the very beginning he was a murderer and he abide not in the truth because there is no truth in him when he speaketh he speaketh a lie he speaketh his, of his own for he is a liar and the father of lies and because I tell you the truth you do not believe me but here's a powerful question. Which of you can convict me of any sin? You told me I'm a devil. Which of you can convict me of any sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God, hear it, God's words. 
but you do not hear God's word because you are not of God. You're of the devil. And the Jews answered and said unto him, Did we not tell you before that you are a Samaritan? And you are a devil? Jesus answered, I am not a devil. But I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one whom seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily I say unto you, if a man keep, and this is what bothered me, my saying, he shall never die. Where this man comes from? Then the Jews answered him, saying, Are you greater than our father Abraham? Who is dead? Abraham is dead. And the prophets are all dead. Who make you? Where do you get your message from, fella? Are you not Joseph's son? Are you not in Joseph's carpenter shop learning carpentry? Which school have you been? Where have you gotten your knowledge from? Jesus answered in verse 54 of St. John 8. If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. But it is my father who honors me. Yeah. Of whom you say that he is your God. 55. Yet you have not known him. But he is your God and you have not known him. But I know him. And if I should say I know him not. I shall be telling a lie like unto you. But I know him. And I keep his words. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, You are not even 50 years old. And you have seen Abraham. And this is where we close. Class, here is it. The bombshell in verse 58. Of the text, St. John 8. This settles the matter. Argument is finished. Our Lord said unto them, Verily, verily, I truly, truly, may I tell you something, guys? Before Abraham was, I am. That aggravated them. And they gather stones to cast at him, to kill him. But Jesus hid himself. And went out of the temple. Walked in the midst of them. And they didn't see him. Passed by them. Pushed them out of the way as it were. And they did not see him. My brothers and sisters. All that was going on. From the very first verse of St. John 8. To the verse 59. Of our text. Of St. John chapter 1 rather. All what has been going on from the very first verse of St. John chapter 1 is that how our Lord was revealing his true identity to them as the one sent by God, the Holy Father, to be their Redeemer. But they being blind like Bartimaeus just could not see the truth. And they were deaf, just could not hear the eternal truth. Even though the New Testament scriptures have more than 130 times telling people about the Messiah. And more than 300 prophetic passages point to the Messiah. Where he will come from. How he will reach here. Ah, yet the Jews had not seen it and they did not believe anything. What he will do. Ah. And according to the prophet Isaiah, the Messianic prophet, in his prophetic declaration in chapter 9, all these prophecies are being fulfilled in one person. Jesus is son of the eternal father. And yet the Jews denied his existence. Class, the revelation of Jesus Christ, the infinite one, 
according to our studies, is very lacking. We will never be able to exhaust it. Don't forget, we are doing an entire series of Jesus Christ, the story of redemption. Jesus Christ, the story of redemption. And we'll never be able to exhaust it. This is the first in the series. Yes. He being the faithful and true witness of his heavenly father. And the express image of his father's person. Is the supreme devotion to his father's will. As he came to this world to work out his father's divine revelation to humanity. He came to abolish error and establish the truth. I came to clean up moral pollution and establish purity. Came to abolish selfishness and establish benevolence. He came, he came to die for man's sin, didn't he? Yeah. He came to destroy sin by sacrificing himself. Yes. He made himself of no reputation and took upon himself a form of a servant and was made in the likeness of human. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Ah, may the God of heaven allow you to grasp the truth about him. And this story lends itself to be a very long one. Jesus Christ, the story of redemption. If he permits us, we'll pick up second in the series next Wednesday. If we meet, God bless you. Don't forget, we'd love to hear from you. And our prayers are with you. Good evening. When it seems